Bacchus is uh, building massive Angular apps. I think that's what it's called. Uh, my name is Gordon Bacchus. I'm uh, the lead client-side developer at Spanning Cloud Apps in Austin, Texas. Don't worry, Oklahoma native. Oklahoma native. I only live in Austin. Uh, I want to throw a shout out to Spanning. Uh, they do awesome things like let developers come and speak at conferences, miss work, go party down. It's excellent. Uh, I've been building web applications for 10 years. Uh, I've built large applications in Dojo, EXTJS, Angular, Node, Java, you name it, lots of different things. Uh, Self-proclaimed build nerd, I've done the JavaScript build in Maven. Very sad times, but once you've done that, all this JavaScript build stuff is great. Uh, and finally, I think selfies are great whenever you have mustaches. So any facial hair, <laughs> mustaches, that's where I go. All right, so what are we talking about today? Uh, we're gonna talk about building a large enterprise class web application using Angular. Uh, it's a discussion around Z point zero to enabling your team to build a large application, right? So what tools are we going to use? What techniques are we going to put in place early to try and encourage the growth of the, encourage quality as the code grows, right? Like we want to get best practices in place and get some automation so that team members, they come in, they come out. We have uh, new directions in the product. We want to make sure that the product can grow uh, successfully and keep high quality, high maintainability, all that good software enterprise, software engineering stuff. So why we do this is because building large applications is really hard, right? Having multiple developers all work on the same application at the same time is a difficult task. You have to coordinate, you have to pay attention to how the code's being written. If everyone's just cowboy coding alone, then it's not long before things implode. Uh, the complexity is, is high. Anyone who's built a web application knows there's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of things you have to consider, different browser support. What, what's the server side doing? And it just as the application gets bigger, as more time goes by, it only gets harder and harder. Finally, technology. All you guys are JavaScript guys, you know, we do releases about every other day. So if you have any open source dependencies, they change all the time. There's probably some brand new tool out there that you could use that does everything in a whole new way that's completely different and better. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, and finally, time. Just as time passes, as more people touch the code, as the product progresses, things get more complicated. Things get harder. So as I was putting that slide together, I realized how lame it sounded. It was like, how do you talk about how hard software is? There's people out there writing their thesis on how hard it is to build software. How do you do the right process for building software? So here's my example. So this guy, the engineering team, has been given a task. We're going to build something to get us from floor zero to floor one. This is what we come up with. It's a set of stairs. It makes perfect sense. Uh, we're going MVP, so no paint. We might sand it. You may have to wear shoes. But uh, it will get you from floor zero to floor one. This is what the product management team wants. They're going to tell you they want to get floor zero to floor one, but really they want to cover you know, as many possible floors as could ever exist. Uh, they want there to be an access ramp that runs along the outside for accessibility. You need to include, you need to be sure and use five different kinds of materials. Um, and eventually it will turn into an escalator that they'll wait until the very end to let us know. Uh, and then this is what the design team wants. <laughs> You'll notice there's no straight lines in this design. Uh, it's made of marble, granite, uh, chrome, and it is a work of art. And so we all get together, we mash our minds together, we make compromises, and then two years later we end up with something like this. <laughs> Nobody really knows how it works, but it gets the job done. So okay, the goods. I'm going to talk about three main things today. Uh, first, the hard stuff, sort of the meta around development, the agreements that we make as developers and as a team as to how we get the job done. Then the build specifically, it'll be a grunt build just because that's how I roll right now. Uh, but everything sort of is applicable, applicable across other build types, you know, grunt and gulp, they both do the same thing, it just looks a little different. Uh, and finally, I'll get into the Angular specifics of things that you can do in Angular to uh, enable your project to grow and to enable different developers to be successful across the code base. So first, the hard stuff. I thought this picture of the salmon swimming upstream was equivalent to this. This is that poor developer who's like, I don't like semicolons, and everybody else is like, blah, and just barfs downstream to try and <laughs> keep him from achieving his goal. But uh, <laughs> so. 
this is the hard stuff that your team, and, and keep in mind, I'm not suggesting that your team get together and have a week-long meeting where you hash out all this stuff. This is progressive enhancement, right? So as you guys are working together to build a product, pay attention to what's going on in the code, pay attention to how you're doing things, and whenever you see a conflict, there are two different ways of doing something, talk about it. Figure out why you're doing it one way versus the other. So for coding standards, we're talking about documentation. How do you document your code? What, what specific pieces need what kind of documentation? What does it look like? Is it using JS doc? Do you have object parameters? How do you document object parameters? I mean, this is sort of like the boring stuff, but if you have made agreements on your team and you all do it consistently, it just makes it a lot easier to consume the code as new people come in and as, as you go into pieces of the code that you've never touched before. Um, spacing, so we're using two spaces, four spaces, tabs, just ha have the throwdown, make the decision. Everyone do it the same. Naming conventions, uh, you know, are we going for the really super long variable names that are very descriptive, or do we try to keep things short? Do we allow single letter variables? Um, for our, all our controllers in Angular, do they end in CTRL? For all our services, do we name them something factory, something service, you know? Just as you find these best practices, be sure to document them. Oh, and that's something I should have mentioned, is uh, whenever you make decisions on these, write them down. Keep a wiki, put it in your GitHub readme. But be sure to write it down, that way it stays consistent. As you move forward, you can reference it in code reviews to talk about this is why we do it this way. You can remember why you made that decision. And as the project grows and the document gets bigger, I mean, it shouldn't be a huge maintenance task because this, once this all gets into place, it's all sort of there, but it's definitely good to have it as a reference once you get there. Uh, and finally, code syntax. I think it's good to agree on if we drop the curly down to the next line, or do we keep it at the end of the line? Do we use semicolons? Uh, you know, how, just some really general stuff like that whenever people do it differently. It's, if it makes a difference, talk about it. You might decide that we can do it both ways and it's fine, but at least have the discussion. Uh, code review technique, whenever I talk about code review technique, it's number one, you should have code reviews. So decide that early. And uh, think about how many people need to review the code. What are we looking for when we review code? What kind of commits do I want to be looking at? Is it okay to have these big gargantuan Java style, you know, where the scroll bar is just a tiny little thing in the corner you can barely get with your mouse, or do we want to have a lot of small commits that are easy to consume? Uh, how often do you want to try and commit code? Those kinds of decisions. At least talk about it. Have a general rule for what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and then finally, my wish list down at the bottom is the automatic formatter that will be run against your code. As you merge into master, I've never been able to convince a team to do this. There's always something. Always. Always something. But if you can get it done, good for you. Uh, these are just a couple of examples from our document from one of the projects that we did, uh, just to kind of lay out exactly what I was talking about. So these are both talking about documentation. Uh, the object parameter, I included this one because it was a very hot and heavy topic of conversation. Some people love them, some people hate them. I, I like them. Uh, but we ended up coming to the compromise that if you have five or more parameters, use an object parameter, or if you have any optional parameters. Uh, and then that's, this is just, the only reason I included our JS doc, uh, blurb here is because it took 10 points to talk about documentation. You know, why would it take that many? It's, well, it's because it's complicated. There's a lot of things going on. Especially if you had, we had a lot of Java developers coming in and writing Node for the first time, so we were arguing about what exactly this should, list lo this should look like and if it should J Java doc correctly, which is always an interesting conversation because they never uh, generate Java doc, but <laughs> we, uh, so we, we came to this agreement. All right, so now on to the good stuff. We're done with the hard stuff. Uh, first thing I'm going to talk about, Yaomin. Who in here has ever used Yaomin? All right, a few hands. Um, so Yaomin is a tool, uh, open source tool provided by Google that's used for scaffolding, scaffolding applications. So what that means is basically you can come in and install this tool and have a running application after going through their command line flow of, of installing the app. Uh, they use generators. I'm going to be talking about the Angular generator specifically today. Uh, that's, this was like the first generator that came out with Yaomin. It just, you um, run Yo with the Angular generator, and in the end, you have an Angular web application that has a grunt build. It has the Bower package manager, and it's all ready to go. You run a couple of commands, and the app is up and running in your browser. Um, let me show you real quick. The, I have an example uh, project that I did along with this presentation. So it has two commits. Uh, I just tweeted out the GitHub repo and the slides for this talk. 
And you should, if you go to the GitHub repo, there's two different branches on this guy. The first branch is what Yaoman spits out just initially. It was like Yaoman, create app, commit everything, push. And then the second uh, branch on this guy is after I've made all the updates that I'm going to suggest. So if you're curious, if there's something that I don't quite hit enough on or you didn't quite understand, I'd say go out and take a look at this repo after the talk. Feel free to send me questions or, or just interact with me through GitHub. Uh, Go. Oh. Ah. All right. So Yaman is super powerful. It's awesome that you can run this tool from Google. Some guy decided what the best practices were, and everything just magically shows up and runs. But the power. It's so powerful. But with great power comes great responsibility. Thanks, Uncle Ben. <laughs> so it's your responsibility, after you've created these projects, to dig in and understand what exactly is going on. How does this build work? What are all these magical words in this grunt file? And what, what do they accomplish? Why are they in here? Why do they set up the code in the index.html file this way? So just go in understanding that you can't expect to create, use this tool and then just run forward with it. You need to at least take time to understand pieces as you encounter them. So digging into this guy, it's an excellent start, very developer friendly, um, works across platforms, is, is Super easy. It's production ready. Yaman has a uh, produces a grunt file that has a build in it. So you run grunt build, and it'll build a distributed application, minifies all your HTML, tags all your images, does all sorts of magic that we'll talk more about. But keep in mind that it's not perfect. It's definitely not perfect for whatever application you're building. So dig in Angular generator. Um, it has lots of really nice features. Uh, one is it comes with a node server built in. So after you run your generator, you say node serve, and the web page pops open in your browser. Uh, live reload. Anyone use live reload? Yeah? It's a really uh, huge productivity boost. I remember the first time that I, I ran into this tool, I was just like, my mind was blown. Basically, it monitors all of your resources. And anytime that anything changes, it injects it through WebSockets. Either in, it either injects like style changes that can be implemented in the page, or if it needs a refresh, it automatically refreshes the browser. So you don't have to pay attention anymore to that workflow of like change, 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 deploy, refresh, refresh, refresh. Like it just keeps everything synced in the development environment. So I definitely suggest taking a look at that if you've never seen it. Uh, it comes with Compass and SAS. SAS is a CSS preprocessor that adds a lot of sugar syntax to CSS, makes, main, makes CSS easier to maintain and easier to understand, and Compass is a toolkit that's built on top of that. I, I love SAS. Uh, ng-min and minification it also comes with something called HTML-min I probably should have put on there. And that's, uh, those are all tools that understand how to minify your code. Uh, Bower injection. So Bower is the NPM for client-side applications. It uh, is just a package manager that's specific for JavaScript code that you want to run in your browser. So you basically have Bower to so go find libraries and dependencies that you want to use uh, client-side. And then we have NPM for node modules. And NPM is where we get everything that does the build. Uh, JS, oh, Bower injection. One cool thing about this, this was new. Uh, when I put this talk together, I had done a project like a year ago and sort of halfway kept up with this. And then I, whenever I was putting this talk together, uh, I found some new stuff. This was one of them. Basically, it understands whenever you go out and you find a new Bower dependency, the next time you build, it'll inject it in your HTML file. So there's no more like keeping up with exactly where things live and what the minified files are and all that good stuff. So I thought that was a really cool feature. Uh, JS Hint. JS Hint is a linting tool. We're probably all familiar with it. Uh, it's configurable. It automa it's set up automatically to run with your builds or with your uh, tests. And it uh, uses a configuration file locally that you can update. And finally, it's test ready. There's a single test that's written against one of the default controllers. And at least all of that infrastructure is there. So when you run grunt test, it goes out and executes a single test in the browser. Uh, and it's ready for you to expand on that. So my customizations. Uh, these are customizations I'm not going to go through deeply. There's some more slides after this where I get more specific. But I just wanted to hit on these points real quick. So pay attention to configuring JS Hint. There's a ton of options that you can turn on and off. There are different environments in JS Hint. So be sure to at least consider what changes you want to make whenever you're initially setting up your application. Are there any uh, 
you know, conflicts with how you generally like code in the JS hint file, those can be disabled. Don't just blatantly assume everything it tells you is correct. Uh, Grunticon, this was something that sort of saved my life at one point because we uh, had to support IE8, which was like from one product to the next was like no IE8 to IE8, so I didn't, I'd forgotten all that fun. And we had decided to use SVGs at the same time. So what Grunticon does is it's a processor for images where it'll take sized SVGs and generate CSS files for cross-browser support. So this gives you sort of the best of both worlds. In the modern browsers, you can use SVGs to have these infinitely scalable <laughs> images, but then in IE8, they still survive in size correctly. So it, uh, I thought it was worth mentioning, in case you have to support IE8 and you're interested in following this path, I would, I would investigate Grunticon. Uh, live reload HTTPS support, once again, this is for my own personal pain. We ran a couple of months without live reload, which was hurting me every day because we couldn't quite <laughs> figure out how to tweak the uh, Grunt file to run in HTTPS. Uh, and this is, of course, affects you once you're, you're developing on HTTPS. Uh, and then finally, updating your dependencies, your Bower and NPM dependencies. So you don't know when the Angular generator was put together. You don't know when the last time it was updated. You should definitely check that. I uh, can't remember now. There's an NPM <coughs> check updates is a node module that's out there that'll go out and check all of them for you and kind of tell you how far behind you are. So I ran this on my example project. Every single dependency needed an update. Great. I uh, went fast and loose and just said, OK, update everything. There was only three major bugs afterwards. I had to uh, update Compass, update Bower, and there was a configuration file change in the grunt file. So be aware when you go and update your dependencies. Pay attention. Go check your change logs on any of the major dependencies that you really care about. Uh, don't just blatantly pull the trigger like I did. That was a big mistake. Um, I live and breathe in this code every day, and it only took me about an hour and a half. So I don't want to subject any new users to, to the pain of figuring out dependency update bugs. All right, HTML2 JS. So this is part of your build. And what it enables is it enables you to have template files that live with your JavaScript code. So I just want to show you real quickly. Uh, so this is my updated project. And in this dude. I have my two different views. So I have this links.temple.html and this main.temple.html. HTML 2JS enables me to have my templates live with my JavaScript code. So these are the two Angular controllers and the two templates that are associated with these views. Um, it actually takes the, uh, it matches based on a syntax that you configure in the grunt files. That's why I use the .tpl.html format. And then it injects it into the template cache for Angular. So it creates a templates.js or whatever you want to name it file. Is that readable? Yeah, it's all right. Um, for load at runtime. So this is one of those sacrifices that you can choose to make or not. For me, it's worthwhile to go ahead and load all the templates up front, pay the price, and then everything is automatically available once the app has rendered. Uh, and, and the other advantage that it gives you is you no longer have to worry about, like, uh, where your URL lives or where your templates live, because there are times whenever you want to reuse templates across controllers. And if you have, are referencing them through a, uh, a direct URL or whatever, it will try to go look it up. Based, and you have to like worry about the dot, 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 slash other directory kind of syntax. When you do it this way, it's always named based on the module name of the file. Um, yeah, once again, it's a build step. And, oh, and don't worry about, I, so the example application has all of these links. So don't worry about like scribbling down links or scribbling down tool names or anything. As long as you, if you can look me up on Twitter, you'll find, find the application to be ready to go. Uh, ng annotate. So uh, Angular annotations, everyone's familiar with those? Yeah, quick overview. So in Angular, it's built around dependency injection. So if you see, this function. So these functions are, are resolves on routes, which basically tells Angular, we want to go and make this HTTP call before this route is rendered. And I want you to inject the HTTP links service into this before I start. So the problem here is if you minify your code, it changes the variable name HTTP links. And then Angular has no idea what you're talking about. So the solution to that was to annotate all of your functions with the 
strings with strings leading up to the function that you want to call with injection that tells it what things you actually want to inject. So if we found this to be a fairly painful process. Um, the original library for dealing with this was called ng-min. And basically what ng-min and ng-annotate do is they process your Angular code and they minify it and they inject annotations right into the minified code. So that solves the problem of having to deal with the comments are not on all your functions. I just think it looks cleaner. It's easier to consume without the annotation. So ng-annotate is the solution. And yeah, like I said, the improvement over ng-min is that it's more broad. You can use third-party libraries, and it understands how to annotate them. With ng-min, the old tool, you were limited to Angular core, so you had kind of a mix of annotated and unannotated code. All right, let's get to some Angular. Phew, this guy advertising <laughs> Angular talk, and we're talking about grunt all day. Uh, so these are a few of the modules. I'm going to talk about UI router and UI bootstrap uh, in depth. And I also, these are modules I suggest you consider adding to your project. Uh, Angular Lodash and Angular Moment. Lodash is a toolkit in JavaScript with lots of different utility functions. And Moment is a date library in JavaScript. And if you go and get the Angular modules for those, it basically gives you two different advantages. One is you can just inject it using the dependency injection where you need it. And you don't have to like you know have a one global variable that you reference that makes things odd for your tests or anything like that. And then the other thing is it provides a lot of filters in uh, Angular. So if we look at my application here. So oh, so real quickly, this is the application running. It's basically, uh, the only thing I've updated from the default Yaoman output is I've kind of updated these links to reference what I'm talking about. Uh, this is an Angular Moment example. I'm formatting this date using Angular Moment. And this is Angular Lodash. It uses the Lodash range function. So if I look in code at what I'm doing, go away. Uh, this AM date format is injected using Angular Moment. So the alternative is to load Moment yourself and write your own filter, or you can just lean on these guys. And then you can see in my Lodash section right here, I'm using the, the Lodash range filter. Uh, to basically print that range of numbers that we saw. So I mean, I know it's a really simplistic example, but that's what uh, how you can inject those third-party tools into your Angular application and keep sort of the Angular frame of mind. So Angular UI router. You know how hard it is to find a funny state picture? There's no funny state pictures. Uh, so the UI router replaces the default Angular router, which is based on URL routing. Uh, the problem with URL routing is if your application is overly complicated, like most of them are, and has multiple states on a single view, then the URL, the URL router requires you to have really big controllers and really big templates that are all sort of like intertwined. Whenever you use a more state-oriented approach, uh, you're able to have like a main abstract state and then have substates. So it's more complex, but you have more power to control exactly what's going to render and when. Uh, the flexible routing gives you the ability to, you know, change out small pieces of your UI based on a state. So like a states are sort of like inherit from one another. Uh, the nested views is along that same lines, and I would say it's this is most of the time whenever I struggle with an Angular problem, like just with configuration, it's usually related to the UI router. Uh, so it's very complex. They have a really great guide on their website uh, and a really great uh, example application. But just always, your, whatever you are trying to do in particular is going to be a little different. You're going to have to learn all the syntax. And I just wanted to switch over. Let me show you where the routing is taking place. So when you use the UI router, you include UI.router is one of your dependencies. You don't include the, the default router. And then you use the state provider to configure. I have a main state and a link state. And so the best way to think about it is on your application, like usually your top level state are going to be the top level pages. And then your substates are going to be whatever you have to deal with down inside of each page. Um, and these are a really simplistic. Uh, example of using UI router, but having sort of like this first pass and then being able to go and start adding in your own views is really the only way to learn it. And then I, I pointed out earlier, uh, this resolve function, and this is available both in the default router, but also in UI router. It's 
it's actually one of the really nice features in Angular when it comes to routing is you have the ability if you have asynchronous dependencies for showing a state, you set them up in this resolve function. So I have links and other links for my link state. Then if I come over here, I can see that this is the controller. This is the, my links controller. And you can see I have a links and another links object. So what this ensures, this ensures that my asynchronous dependencies have already loaded before I try to render my state. I don't have to go through and do that checking, oh, if null or if undefined, and then go back and reload once the data actually gets there. It lets me take care of some of the asynchronous calls prior to actually rendering the view. So it makes for simpler code, easier to test. UI Bootstrap. So these are Bootstrap 3 directives. Uh, that come as part of the UI project. The UI project is an, a project that's maintained by a lot of the Angular core team, and they're just like extra add-ons that they wanted. Um, there's also an alternative called Angular Strap that has a, a nicer documentation page. It's pretty much the same thing. They've just both implemented them. You can take your pick. Uh, it does have custom builds, so if you have just three dependencies and you want to make sure and keep your footprint as small as possible, you can build a custom build and include that in your project. It doesn't use any jQuery, which is nice. In the application, just as a demo, I included, uh, you know, these are these are bootstrap buttons, and I have bootstrap tooltips. Any, anyone ever done EXTJS? Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, well, tooltips are horrible in EXTJS, so this was a big step up. Oops. All right, so code organization. Those are sort of all the modules and things that I think you should consider. There's tons of great ones out there. So take a look. But I think one of the better decisions we made was to organize our code by state. So when you look at a lot of the example projects in Angular, it's always a single module <coughs> with a bunch of controllers all attached in a controllers.js file. And there's a views directory where all the HTML templates live. And then there might be a directives file that contains every directive you ever saw. And it, that works for about one, one view with the simplest possible configuration. So I always sort of hate that that's their number one example because that's always where people start. You want to break out your application into the states. Uh, like I showed previously, I have a main state and a link state. And then organize your code that way. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk through these, then I'm going to go ahead and show you what I'm talking about. Um, for common code that gets used across the application, you should have a common directory that separates them out into the different <coughs> functions. These are five that we use most commonly. There could be others. You could have internationalization. You could have constants. Who knows? Uh, but services, directive, filters, HTTP, and interceptors are five, my five go-to guys. Uh, and then modules and m grouping modules are two really powerful things. Like modules are sort of the same across a lot of different frameworks, but the one thing I would suggest is to have your application use modules in such a way that it sort of always filters up. Uh, and then grouping modules, I'm just going to show you a grouping module because it's simpler than trying to describe it. So this is my common directory I discussed. And then I have this mostly made up use case of an HTTP guy. So I have a links.js guy. You'll notice his module is http.links. And he goes out and gets my links for me. And then I have an other.js, which is http.other module. And he goes out and gets other links for me. And then this guy is my grouping module. So these guys are super simple. But what they do is they basically take a bunch of related modules and they group them all together so that then you can go and add the top level module to your application. So in here, I have my Angular app.http, right? So by including HTTP, that means as I move forward and as other team members go and create new HTTP-related services, those guys just get added to the grouping file and everything just continues to work. You don't have to go touch the app.js file. You don't have a list of dependencies 10 miles long in this guy. So it's just been a, uh, a really good organizational thing. And then also think about your modules as a, as a hierarchy. So my top-level module is Angular Yaoman app, the mouthful module. And then in main.js, I'm that guy dot main, right? And so these module names don't necessarily, you can't have repeats and there's like some rules around what characters you can use, but I mean, just naming them like this implies that main relates back to the Angular Yaman app. It doesn't, it's not necessarily enforced that way, but ha having this naming convention keeps it simple about where what lives. And then as you start having tons of substates and those all kind of trickle up with the same pattern, it just becomes much easier to maintain and to keep up with what goes where.
A few other concepts I just wanted to briefly touch on because they're complicated and they're worth thinking about. Uh, services versus factories. There's probably a thousand really good blog posts written about Angular services versus factories and which you should use and what they do. Uh, and I think the best line from one I ever read was, most of the time a factory will get it done. So I would say just use factories most of the time and then whenever you run into that situation where you care about instantiating something in a service, then go back and read a few of those blog posts. Uh, promises. I'm a big fan of promises for dealing with asynchronous code. They, Angular comes with a uh, subset of the Q library, which is a big node promise library. It doesn't do everything, but it does the, the bare minimum. Uh, it basically means that you can attach then handlers. I showed you guys that resolve function in the routing. Uh, and it just makes life a lot simpler. You don't have to do it. The one use case that it solves for me that makes it all worthwhile is whenever I have two asynchronous dependencies that I need to load before I can do something. And how do I know that both have come back? Promises take care of that problem for you. So no more keeping counters and saying how many times have things gotten back and all that good stuff. Uh, directives. Um, my one bit of advice about directives is, number one, don't let that be the first thing you read about, because it is the most complicated thing in Angular. And don't go to directive crazy. Only use directives for components that you're going to be reusing across your application. Only do it where it really makes sense. A lot of people kind of get into directives and they start living the lifestyle and then you end up with directives everywhere and nobody knows what's going on. So be very careful. And finally, testing, right? Test, test your UI code. Uh, typically, UI developers have a really bad reputation around writing tests. We're like, oh, I tested it in the browser, works in Safari, it's great, but write unit tests. Test all your controllers. Uh, nothing is better when your application gets huge than having the set of tests that verify that everything's still working as you expect it. And then when you find bugs, go fix the bug, then write a test that exercises that logic. Okay, so final thoughts. Learn your tools. Dig in. If you decide to use Yaman, go find out what all that stuff does. Uh, keep up with releases. Pay attention to Angular. Pay attention to some of the other third-party libraries that you use. Make sure that you don't end up so far behind that you can't catch up on whatever new hotness is coming out. Um, and these adjust as necessary. Go and make changes. If your team is working together and you run into a conflict, go figure out what you need to change. Go update your documents. Uh, enhance often. There's always new stuff coming out in JavaScript. If there's something that comes out that makes it a, that, that is a better way to accomplish something that you're struggling with, go out. Take the time. Make the change. Uh, finally, write your tests. Write your tests. Write your tests. Go build something. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have time for questions? 1004? Yeah. Sure. What kind of balance do you usually go with for, between unit and integration tests? Uh, I heavily favor unit tests, mostly because integration tests are really hard. <laughs> have you worked with Protractor at all yet? I have not. Uh, I can't remember what the old tool was called, but whenever I initially got heavy into it, it was the older tool, and it just we had some problem that caused it to fail. But I think integration tests are good. Uh, but it's sort of like a separate task outside like the development flow. So I think you should write your unit test as you're committing your code, pay, pay a lot of attention to making sure you have full coverage there, and then have a separate focus on maybe giving a developer a couple days a week where they go and update integration tests and make sure everything gets exercised from the system level. Yeah? Do you have any tooling around continuous integration or other kind of post commit build tools? Uh, yeah, Travis is really good. It's really great for JavaScript. Um, and it's free for open source projects and all that good stuff. I'd say check that one out. And then, you know, if you need to get into heavy integration testing or if you have a, a really heavy server side, I think you always end up with Jenkins and that whole mess. But yeah, Travis is the nice, nice way to go. Yeah? Do you have an example that you can share of a, of a truly massive application? Um, sure. Nobody tell my boss. <laughs> so Spanning writes SaaS backup applications, and this is our application that backs up Salesforce. I don't think there's anything, you know, 
This is all JavaScript, so if you really want to see it, you can just look in the browser of it. Uh, web app. app. So this guy has turned into three applications that all share some of the same code base. We have our main application, then we have a mobile style application, and then we have uh, the application that's used for doing administrative tasks. So that's why we have bad men common and that kind of stuff. Uh, here's my script directory. So these are our different views. So it's basically how many different views we have in the application. And then this is probably our more complicated one. And what you end up with is we have sort of a top level abstract view. I think. Uh, I'm not going to dig too much into the code just because I don't know exactly what's in here. But I mean, this is an example of a guy that has lots of substates, lots of different views and basically you know if I get something to go fix in the API limit I know exactly where to go and look in the admin dude. Any more questions? No, oh, sure. In Sonic it's a lot about I'm using your mental scaffold on that to create an initial app. Um, have you had any experience using the generator to build controllers or services or anything like that? Yeah, Yo can do that. It has the functionality built in to go and add controllers and do things like that. And I, my experience has always been that that's really nice when I don't know anything about how it's all set up, but then I'm too picky after I kind of have my own mechanism, and so then I just end up creating them myself. Uh, I don't think that there's, that's better than having the, the tool do it for you, but that's just my personal preference. Um, see, you're using um, Brand, and I'm just building the source code right now. Uh, yeah, I considered it. The I think it's fine. I might always my opinion on all JavaScript frameworks, uh, build or otherwise, is they all kind of get the job done. There's always a way to get there. It's just preference for okay. for what you want to use. And if there are generators in Yaomin for producing gulp backed applications. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Back over here. Yeah. Um, so we're in a position where we have a, uh, I guess, a Java backend uh, combining our REST services and an Angular front end within the same project, uh, which may be a terrible idea. Uh, but have you seen anyone sort of uh, integrate a run process into a Maven build so that it can all be one very terrible idea? So, so, <laughs> so I have. So actually, one, our, one of our products does that. Uh, our latest product, uh, we ended up going back to a mix of Node and Java for the back end, and Angular and Grunt for the front end. And the way that it works is we have a Grunt build on top of all of our Node and our Angular project, and then we have a Maven project that sits on top of that. And there's actually a Grunt plugin for Maven. It turned. It's. It's not bad. Not. Not great. Not bad. <laughs> Uh, I mean, this worked really well. Like when you start out with like an empty code base, do you have any advice for if you're converting some complex app over? Um. Yeah, for, I mean, you just, I would say the best thing to do would be to go and look at something like this and get a good foundation for what you would like to add, figure out what pieces make sense for you, and then go and try and integrate piecemeal. I think, you know, it's obviously going to be too expensive to completely cut the legs out from under. You're probably not going to get management buy in to say, hey, can we have a month to go change how we build everything? But uh, just try to make your changes as you go and try and add new things. And there are other options. You know, if you can't do a full JavaScript build and you already have a different build system in place, just figure it out. You can go and use these grunt tools directly on your, your code base, right, through just executing from the command line. So maybe you can have a grunt build that executes your JS lint and executes your test, and then you just, you know, spawning that from Maven or, or wherever you're doing your build. So just, yeah, small pieces. And then once, once you see all the goodness, just commit at some point. Okay? All right, well, hey, thanks, guys. If you have any more questions, come up with something. Thanks,